This is for Keeps, a podcast about collections and connections. I'm David Peterkovsky. It's a free concert from now on. That doesn't mean that anything goes. What that means is we're going to put the music up here for free. What it means is that the people who put backing this thing, who put up the money for it, are going to take a bit of a bath, a big bath. For a few days in the summer of 1969, a farm in upstate New York was the unlikely site of one of the largest and most iconic rock music festivals of all time. With a few hundred thousand young music fans watching, some of the biggest names in pop music at the time took the stage to entertain the massive audience on hand. But who would have guessed that nearly half a century after the fabled event, a music fan would also take the stage, literally. The event in question was the legendary Woodstock Music and Art Fair, held in August 1969 on the property of dairy farmer Max Yasker in Bethel, New York. Billed as three days of peace and music, the event turned out to be just that for the most part, although it did stretch into a fourth day. Providing the era-defining music was a who's who of artists. 32 acts in all, including Jimi Hendrix, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Joe Cocker, Joan Baez, The Who, Sly and the Family Stone, Santana, Janis Joplin, The Grateful Dead, and Creedence Clearwater Revival, to name just a few. Estimates put the crowd size at roughly a half million attendees, most of them epitomizing the peaceful, progressive ways of the hippie counterculture that rippled through young America at the time. As impressive as the list of entertainers was, Woodstock's ultimate legacy may be more cultural than musical. When people reflect on the hippies of the 1960s, there's a good chance they're conjuring up images of long-haired, bell-bottomed young people frolicking in the great outdoors, which was precisely the scene on Max Yasker's farm. Woodstock's overall good vibes also came despite many challenges, chief among them rainy weather that transformed the farm into a giant mud bath and epic traffic jams on the surrounding country roads that kept people from showing up on time and made it hard to bring food and water to the site when supplies ran short. Despite it all, and maybe in part because of it, Woodstock remains not only a revered milestone in rock music history, but also a pivotal event of the 1960s peace movement that swept up so many young people along the way. One of those young people was Steve Gold, Just 15 years old when he attended Woodstock, he was a local kid who'd already dabbled in rock concert promotion in the area. And, after the festival, he found himself helping transport what had been the plywood stage from Woodstock to a nearby resort community where the wood panels were used to build, of all things, a paddleball court. Recalling that vague memory decades later, he tracked down those panels, bought them in 2017, had them authenticated as the actual Woodstock stage panels, and then did what any entrepreneur would do, start a business with them. Steve's venture is called Piece of Stage, and through it, music fans can purchase newly created collectibles, ranging from pendants to keychains to piece pipes, all of which feature a piece of the actual Woodstock stage panels that Steve collected. He's also given portions of the stage to many of the musicians who played at Woodstock, and he's donated other pieces to museums, including the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and even the Smithsonian. And Steve's got a nice little collection of other Woodstock memorabilia at his home north of New York City, a tribute to the celebrated music event that changed so many lives, including his own. By the time Woodstock was announced, young Steve had already made a name for himself locally in the area of live music and he couldn't wait to see what the festival would bring. I grew up in South Fallsburg, uh, New York, in the Catskills, which is about 12 miles from uh, Max Yasger's farm, where, you know, Woodstock happened. 
so, you know, being so close, once the concert was approved for Sullivan County, which was probably a month before the actual concert, I would go up there every day to see how everything was progressing. And, you know, one of the things I always saw was the stage being built and no fences at that time because, you know, that's later. (laughs) It was an exciting thing to see, you know, all these hippies, you know, don't forget I was 15 years old. You know, all these hippies were coming up. Plus, you know, I was promoting some concerts. So all these bands that I loved were coming up and uh, it was an exciting time. So you were working as a promoter as a teenager? Yeah, I uh, started promoting concerts at 14 years old. My first concert was Vanilla Fudge and the Blues Project. And uh, then I produced other shows. I had The Who, Chambers Brothers, Four Tops, Jeff Beck Group. So, you know, I was into the music scene and... uh, You know, I just wanted to see what was going on. And it was not knowing, you know, what's going to happen, you know, when the concert happened, how many people showed up. It was just amazing. Being a local, Steve found his way to Max Yasger's farm easily, despite all the traffic. And he even worked his way to the festival's backstage area. Not that it was so hard. So did you have tickets for the show or did you just kind of show up? Uh, I showed up. Even if it had a ticket, it didn't matter because everything was free. But what was great for me, because I knew the back roads, I was able to drive in and out. So I would see some shows, then go back home, come back the next day and see some shows. But I still was, you know, sitting in the crowds, getting wet. You know, those days, the uh, backstage area wasn't what it is today, you know, with uh, security. Anyone can come and go. You know, you just pass the security guy a joint and he would let you in. (laughs) Those were the good old days. (laughs) (laughs) So joints aside, do you have any favorite memories of the festival itself? Well, it's a hard one because there isn't anything that's unmemorable about it. I I guess the whole thing of just seeing a city built, you know, on farmland that, you know, I knew, you know, and knowing my family knew Max Yasger, but just being there and hanging out backstage and sitting down with Grace Slick and Janis Joplin, you know, it was very, very casual. Uh, you know, it's not like today when, you know, the backstage scene is, you know, a whole Instagram Coachella scene. Uh, everything is planned. This nothing was planned. So that made it even better. But seeing the acts, and again, I also got to see uh, Jimi Hendrix do his uh, Star Spangled Banner which was incredible. But I would say the whole, anytime I'm there, it's still in my head as a wonderful memory. And how did you become aware of what became of the Plywood Woodstock stage after the event? So after I was dating a a girl whose parents owned a bungalow colony, uh, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with bungalows, is... You know, they were single family cottages and everyone would go up there for the summer. And my parents owned one also. And uh, this was right after Labor Day. And after Labor Day, you start adding on to your bungalows because every year you grow. So that summer, after the summer, my girlfriend's father, Alex, decided he's going to be building a paddleball court. And, you know, a basketball court, you know, all, all these all in one inclusion sports things, whatever you want to call it. So I'm at the bungalow colony one day hanging out with Robin, my girlfriend at that point, And her father drives in with a truck full of plywood panels. And he asked me if I can help him unload it. So I said, sure. And we're unloading the truck, and he says to me, you know, I just bought this. This is the stage from Max's. At that point, no one was calling it Woodstock yet. It it became really Woodstock, you know, right after the movie came out. But the locals always called it Max's Farm. So I'm helping him unload it. He tells me that. And for some reason, just stayed in my brain. It was nice to know, but there wasn't like, oh, my God, oh, my God type thing. And it just stuck in the back of my memory. As the golden anniversary of Woodstock approached, 
Steve revisited that memory of the plywood stage panels, and eventually he was able to revisit the wood itself. Three years before the 50th anniversary, I said to myself, you know, I wonder if that paddleball court is still there. So I drove up to the bungalow colony and uh, I found it. It was all the way in the woods, you know, overgrown with brush and trees and there's water all around it. And I asked the owner of the bungalow colony if I could remove some panels. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And I removed some of the panels and there were the markings that, you know, you see on most of the pictures and the stage pictures. You had the Weyerheiser logos all over. You had color lines where they put on the stage, you know, where to put the wires, where to put the uh, stage in the round. And uh, also there were double nail holes. And the double nail holes were because they had built some of the stage already in Walk Hill where the concert was originally supposed to take place. And when that was turned away, they had to rebuild the stage, take it apart and rebuild it and take it up to uh, Yazgers. So uh, when I saw that, I offered the owner money to buy it. And uh, again, he looked at me like I was crazy. But there was a method to Steve's apparent madness. Once he purchased the panels, he then needed confirmation that the wood he dutifully tracked down was... Authentically speaking, the wood from Woodstock. And uh, then I, we had it authenticated by wood authenticators who showed that the plywood grade and the way the wood was made was pre-1970. And then we checked with the Weyerheiser who had their own codes on the plywood. And they said that it was manufactured pre-1970. No one would tell me that, oh, this is the exact wood from Bethel because they had no way to prove it. But based on the logos and, and looking at pictures of where the logos were and the colored lines, it was everyone agreed that this is the original stage. And then, you know, we decided that, you know, this is an exciting piece of history. Let's share it with the world. But I wanted to share it with the world where people would be able to touch the stage so they can feel hopefully the emotion that went on and that stage during 1969. And I want to get back to the bungalow colony and the condition it was in and the condition the wood was in. I mean, you mentioned water being all around. What kind of shape were these panels in? Well, the believe it or not, they were in incredible shape. Uh, when Alex built the paddleball court, he also built an overhang on top, which was very unusual. And he did that. So when it rained, the rain would not drip down the panels. It would be like a pitch roof. So the rain would drop away from it. He also built it with double panels. So Every panel had a back and a front. So there were a panel and then one front, one back. So each part of the paddleboard court was three panels thick. So when we started taking it apart, the inner panel were gorgeous. They looked brand new, you know, still with the markings. But the only water damage was the bottoms of where the, the paddleboard court was. Other than that, it was an amazing how it stood 48 years of nature. But, uh, you know, everything about Woodstock's a miracle. So I just make it uh, another miracle of Woodstock. This stage would survive. Another miracle? The owners of the bungalow property didn't ask too many probing questions as to why Steve was so interested in the generic-looking plywood on their dilapidated property. And when you went to purchase the panels, did you tip your hand as to why you wanted them? Uh, not really, because I still didn't know what it was. Uh, so basically, you know, I told the guy I'm building a museum that I'm going to take on the road, you know, about Sullivan County, and I want to have original memorabilia part of it. But eventually, once it was uh, certified, I told the owners what it was. I see. And they had no clue because it was sold to, you know, Orthodox Jews, and they knew nothing about Woodstock. <laughs> they weren't there. They weren't there. <laughs> the provenance and authenticity of an item go a long way toward determining its value as a collectible. So Steve left no stone unturned in getting the wood panels authenticated, even involving Michael Lang, 
the organizer of the Woodstock Festival back in 69. How did you go about authenticating the plywood? You mentioned Weyerhaeuser. Yeah, well, like with Google, you Google a wood authenticator and somebody came up that was near, you know, where we live. And I gave him the wood and he examined it, you know, took the panels apart. He even, you know, he just knew exactly what to look for. And if you go to our website, you can see his report of how he was 99% confident this was the original Woodstock stage. And, you know, then we had uh, Michael Lang authenticate it. He said, yep, this is a stage. And, you know, we donated it of some of the panels to the Bethel Woods Museum. Uh, they did their due diligence and they were satisfied. And same thing with the Grammy Museum and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We all gave them panels, and about a month ago, our panels were part of the opening of the new exhibit at the Smithsonian called Entertainment Nation. We have our own room there, and they have the panels so people can actually stand on the Woodstock stage. And they do their due diligence also to make sure it's authentic. And though the wood from the stage has made it to some big-name museums, Steve always had another goal in mind. Was the goal always to create collectible items using the wood from the stage? Yes, uh, that was my idea. And also to give panels away, like to museums, because we felt it was important to let the world know that these pieces still exist. And I just felt, you know, why keep it to myself? And we started selling it as memorabilia. You know, we, we made different products from it. We cut the wood up. And people love it. It's the most amazing feedback we get when people purchase these items. You know, the the emails we get back, the emotions that people have by wearing it. And what we found, as a matter of fact, this past holiday season, uh, we geared some of our advertising to TikTok. And we hired some, uh, you know, millennial influencers. And we did a whole big uh, sale for millennials or even Generation Z who bought these things for their great-grandparents or for their grandparents or for their parents. People just love, you know, having it next to them or wearing it or touching it because Woodstock is a word that people through all generations know it. And it also is a happy word. So when you talk to people about Woodstock, there's always a smile on somebody's face. And they all have something nice to say. So, you know, it's a it's a whole feel good process that we're doing. And, and instead of just wood, just lying in the woods, rotting away, I'm sure after 100 years, uh, we get to share it with people. And we also donate. Uh, we have certain memorabilia that we donate to charities, which we felt was important to give back as Woodstock was about that. We're able to share this with the world. And I mean literally the world. We, we've sold items everywhere around the world. And the collectibles themselves, who has come up with the ideas for the items that you've upcycled from the plywood? Well, I have a partner and his team and my team, and we come up with different ideas. Anything that's crazy, we try to do it. And we do everything ourselves. We make everything ourselves. So it's not like we have to send it out to get made. And uh, you know, each one is carefully made to make sure the wood fits, it's the right wood, no chips. So our quality control is excellent. Mm -hmm. The peace pipe jumped out at me among all the items you have. Yeah, that's new. And that's doing very, very well. Uh, what I found interesting is I thought the pipe would be a big seller. But what I found is that the trays, you know, the cleaning trays, you know, uh, when people roll their own, whatever they're rolling, does very well. And I thought that wouldn't do well at all because no one cleans their drugs anymore. <laughs> you know, you go to the uh, dispensary and everything is clean for you. So I didn't think anybody would need that anymore, but that sells very, very well. <laughs> it's for the old school uh, smokers. The old school, I guess. <laughs> they don't. They, I, you know, there's no more double album covers to, uh, you know, clean it. So, uh. 
Some of the collectibles offered by Steve include plaques bearing photos of the Woodstock performers on stage, along with a piece of the stage itself. I'm guessing you had to work with the artists themselves to get them to agree to let Yeah, you- we worked with the artists, and we, not only the artists, but we also worked with the photographers. You know, we got the rights to use everything, to make sure everything, we wanted to make sure every, everything we did was above board, and that's what we did. So everybody, you know, gave permission. We reached out, and the photographers, you know, we pay them a royalty, and uh, it's working well. So does Joe Cocker's estate get a cut of this, or it's just... No, no. The well, the only one that gets a, I wouldn't say a cut is a, a share is the Jimi Hendrix Foundation, where the a portion of the sales goes to buy equipment for autistic kids in high schools. That's terrific. So, since we're talking about charities, can you talk a bit about the charities overall that are benefiting from the sale of some of these uh, collectibles? Right now, we're doing uh, World Kitchen. You know, we're helping uh, feed people in the Ukraine, and we do stuff for uh, diabetes. We donate money to the Vietnam War Memorial in honor of all the soldiers who were killed in Vietnam that weren't able to attend Woodstock. Uh, we do a lot of charities to help feed the homeless, help feed kids. Uh, we deal with the Jed Foundation. We give them money. They help kids talking them out of suicide. And during COVID, we did a lot of charities for small music venues. Uh, we would send them money because a lot of them couldn't survive. So we're happy to give back that way. Uh huh. And what I like about this endeavor is that while it's commercial in a lot of ways, it's also mindful of the history and the legacy of the event itself. And that extends to the museums and other places that now feature pieces of the stage. Can you talk about how you got the stage into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and other places? Practice, man. No. <laughs> oh, that's Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, you know, like everything else in the world, it's who you know or somebody who knows somebody. So our publicist, Michael Jensen and Associates, who we hired to help publicize this, he's one of the foremost rock and roll publicists probably in the world. And he helped us gain entry into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Grammy Museum. The Bethel Museum I did on my own. The Nashville Museum, they reached out to us. And the Smithsonian reached out to us. So let me ask you the devil's advocate question, which you may have encountered along the way. Did you ever run into anyone who felt like selling the stage in pieces runs counter to the idea and ethos of Woodstock? Well, in the beginning, the uh, the museum uh, head at Bethel felt memorabilia or historical value should not be messed with. You know, it shouldn't be cut up and sold. But he was the only one that felt that. Everybody else felt the idea that you're able to share this with people, it's okay to take it apart and, and sell it. And plus, we're using everything. Uh, you know, all the sawdust is where the charities come from. We made that, we call the product Stardust, where we put the sawdust in different uh, glass vials and, and we sell them. That's what goes for the charities. So uh, creative upcycling is happening. Yes, the whole thing is feel good, and it's so important to keep that alive. You know, it, it, what goes on in the world, you know, is sometimes horrible. And when people, you know, hear Woodstock or they buy something, you know, a lot of people have told me they feel like it's a healing crystal. Uh, you know, when they wear it, you know, the pendant, they feel safer and healthier. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's... Michael Lang was uh, inducted into the Long Island Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And uh, we presented him, you know, one of the plaques that we have. It was the first time anyone in public has seen the stage. And I remember going through the crowd and everybody asked what that was. and They wanted to touch it. Oh, I need to touch it. And then a lot of people put their ears to it, you know, like you do with seashells. (laughs) <laughs> and they could swore they heard Jimi Hendrix playing the guitar or, <laughs> you know, Keith Moon's drumming. But then again, a lot of people took the brown acid and it was still affecting them, I guess. <laughs> that they imagined all this stuff. <laughs> Long lasting. Yeah. 
you know, it, it's interesting, you know, when people say, how did you know it was real? You know, my mother-in-law, who lives with us, who's going to be 101 on Sunday, and when I brought some of the panels home, she said to me, how do you know it's real? So I showed her the panels, and then we found a pot seed in one of the holes in the panels. <laughs> so she said, now I know this is the real state. <laughs> So you mentioned uh, encountering some of the musicians who were there. I mean, can you tell some stories of who you've met as a result of having these panels? I met uh, probably 80% of the performers, the main performers that are still alive, whether it's all Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I did not give anything to Young, but we gave that to all of them. John Sebastian, Carlos Santana, you know, Mike Shreve, uh, Greg Rowley. Uh, although Guthrie, Ringo Starr, I got one in which he wore, you know, on stage performing a few times. Some of the people from Iron Butterfly, Edgar Winter, I don't know, so many. You know, the Grateful Dead people, you know, all the surviving members of the dead, John Fogarty. And all these people were given pieces of it as gifts? Well, they we, we get made plaques for them. Like if you look at the Jimi Hendrix plaque, it's a picture of him performing on stage. So when we gave it to Stephen Stills, when I presented it to Stephen, there was a picture of him performing at Woodstock. So, you know, he looked at this picture when I gave it to him, all of them did, from 50 years ago. And they were astonished, you know, how they looked then. And to all of them, it was just amazing. Don't forget, these guys didn't know what they were playing in front of. You know, the idea of performing there, you know, made history and made these acts as big as they are. The wood from Woodstock aside, Steve also has a modest personal collection of memorabilia from the event, including one rare printed piece that he stumbled onto quite a few copies of. I have the original poster. Uh, I have the original tickets. I was lucky to find the original program books. I have a couple hundred of them. And I got that in for the 25th anniversary of Woodstock. I had the merchandising rights to promote the 25th anniversary merchandise. So there was an article, I guess, about me in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, I don't remember. And the woman calls me up and she said, my husband was the printer for these programs. And she says, I don't know if you know the story, but the programs never made it because they couldn't get the programs to the site. And I'm about to throw them out. Would you like them? So I went to their house and she had these boxes of brand new programs. So uh, I bought them from her. And she didn't want any money, but I bought them anyway, and I made a donation to one of her charities she gave me. Sounds like you have a pretty decent collection of things on your own. I mean, just panels notwithstanding. Yeah, Yeah, and, you know, I was very into the Fillmore. You know, I used to go to the Fillmore East a lot, so I have, you know, a lot of memorabilia from the Fillmore. And then, you know, with the Fillmore, I took over the theater that the Fillmore East was in on 2nd Avenue and 6th Street, and I started doing rock concerts again at the site of the old Fillmore East, and it was great to have walk around the site with Bill Graham, who swore he would never set foot in that building again. <laughs> so, I, you know, there's a lot of other history that I have, but uh, my life has been lucky, is that I got to meet all my idols growing up, uh, whether it was Bill Graham, whether it was Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, Timothy Leary, Pretty amazing that I got to meet these people and be friends with them. It had nothing to do with Woodstock, just my whole thing, you know, being involved in music. Mm -hmm. So what did you think of subsequent attempts to resuscitate the Woodstock name, like Woodstock 94? Well, I never thought it could be replicated. And, you know, I, you know, I said that many times, you can't recreate something that wasn't supposed to happen. So that's why I don't think it ever was the same. And look what happened at Woodstock 99. You know, it's like someone saying, I'm going to do a video and hope and it's going to become viral. It doesn't work that way. It became what it is. And that's why it can never be replicated. 
you know, it, it was the music, the, the rain, the weather, and the lack of food. There was probably a million people that tried to get to Woodstock because all the roads were closed. So it's, how do you recreate that? You know, you can't. You got to look in 1969 when people were watching the concert. They were watching the stage. Uh, there was no cell phones. There were, you know, there was no Instagram and Twitter. Uh, there were no screens on the side of the stages so people can see it. Everyone's eyes. So if you had 500,000 people, you had a million eyeballs all looking at one thing at the same time, which now you go to a concert. All people do is hold their phones up and tape it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and all you, you know, when you go to Coachella, it's all about Instagramming. So this to me was about the music, the vibe of the feel and everybody being one, you know, and everybody was the same. There was no hierarchy. People don't realize by the time, you know, Jimi Hendrix played, the place was almost empty. The place stunk. You know, it, it really was a shithole. Uh, you know, all the toilets had overflown, you know, the port of sands, garbage strewn all over the place. It wasn't a pleasant sight after it was over or smell. Besides not being a pleasant sight, it was, you know, it was a disaster area. But Max made sure and, and the Woodstock people made sure it was cleaned up right away. And uh, next year there was the field was growing again for hay. Renewed once again. Yep. So one last question for you. It's been over 50 years since the festival and the name Woodstock still conjures up images of the music and evokes the power of music to bring people together. Why do you think so many decades later it still maintains that cultural appeal? Well, again, I think that if the concert happened as planned, that everyone paid to get in and there was enough food, there would just be another concert. But because of the all the outside forces that happened, and I also think where they were, you know, having this concert in Sullivan County, which is at that point was, the, you know, the, the Borscht Belt was its heyday. And because Sullivan County was a hospitality center, you had all these people coming in with no food and all the hotels, whether it was the Concord Hotel, Grossinger's, Kutcher's, they went into full force and their kitchens would produce thousands and thousands and thousands of meals. You know, the Concord Hotel fed 3,000 people a meal. So at the downtime, they converted their kitchens to make sandwiches, you know, very quick things. And then you had all the bungalow colonies where I'll never forget my mother, you know, at our bungalow colony, she went on the PA with her Yiddish accent. And, and she said, people, they're starving hippies down the road. And we need everybody to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. which <laughs> Everybody did. So, it, you know, I think that's the other reason that it wasn't a disaster because of the infrastructure that Sullivan County had prior to that. You know, that they were able to mobilize and get food out real quick. Mm -hmm. And your mom was there to help. And my mom was there to help those hippies. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, I don't believe there was a curtain at Woodstock, but our curtain is coming down here, which is my wacky way of saying I'm out of questions. So I'm going <laughs> to thank you so much for talking about your amazing efforts to locate and collect the Woodstock stage and to find interesting and creative ways to share the stage with others. This has been, for lack of a better word, a trip. Yeah. And, and, and listen, it's, and, and I thank you for reaching out. You know, it's, it's a lot of fun to talk about it. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye. 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 Well, you might say the story of Steve Gold's quest to reclaim the Woodstock stage is as unique and unexpected as the iconic event it came from. Who knew that modest plywood could move people so much? Context, of course, is everything, and Steve has thoughtfully blended commercialization with commemoration to celebrate the music, memories, and ideals of Woodstock through his creative upcycling, and, for those who were there back in 1969, to provide the ultimate flashback. For Keeps is a production of me, David Peterkovsky. My thanks to Steve Gold for talking in depth about his quest to collect the stage panels from the Woodstock Music Festival and to create new collectibles from what he acquired. At ForKeepsPodcast.com, you'll see photos of Steve, 
some of the items his company has created, and more. You'll also find a link to the website for his collectibles business, Piece of Stage. That's Peace as in P-E-A-C-E, man. The show's theme song is by Still Flyin', and the closing theme is by Eric Frisch. Additional music for this episode was provided by Track Tribe, Wes Hutchinson, and Dan Lebowitz. Thanks for listening to For Keeps. Until next time, keep on keeping on.